Welcome to tonight's edition of Resistance TV. It's 10 years since WikiLeaks published the Iraq War Lock, in fact, 10 years tomorrow, exposing the horrific war crimes of the US. And uh, 10 years ago as well, they published the uh, collateral murder video, which had such a profound impact, I think, on, on worldwide opinion. Now, Julian Assange, of course, is languishing in Belmarsh prison, fighting potential extradition in the United States of America, where he faces a, a jail term of up to 175 years for bringing this inconvenient truth to the attention of the world. So what's the future for investigative uh, journalism? I think this question in the UK has taken on a particular significance in view of the government's uh, plans to give immunity to war criminals and to authorise criminal conduct by the security services. Uh, incredibly, that bill, there was an attempt to amend it to explicitly exclude from the criminal conduct uh, uh, murder, rape and torture. And that was voted down on the floor of the House of Commons. So there's never been a more important time for investigative, brave investigative journalism of the kind that, so that Julian Assange uh, uh, epitomizes. Uh, before I introduce uh, this evening's guest, what I want to do is play a clip uh, from the collateral murder video, just to remind ourselves of the of the horrific war crimes that the US perpetrated in the, uh, in the early two thousand, well, the mid two thousands, in fact. Roger, uh, break. Crazy Horse One uh, Eight, you request permission to uh, engage. In the so the controller tells them they need to stop this uh, evacuation of weapons and bodies. Come on, let us shoot. But it looks like the pilots understand that their commander will give the go signal if there is some interaction with weapons. So they seem to have this understanding uh, that if people pick up the wounded, that is enough reason to, uh, to get permission under the rules of engagement to kill them. Request permission to engage. Bushmaster 7, roger. This is Bushmaster 7, roger, engage. see that they also uh, deliberately target uh, Saeed, the wounded man, uh, on the ground. Despite their earlier uh, beliefs that they didn't have the rules of engagement, uh, that the rules of engagement did not permit them uh, to kill Saeed when he was wounded, when he was rescued, uh, suddenly that uh, belief changed. But you can see in this particular image, he is lying on the ground and the people in the van have been separated, but they still uh, deliberately target and kill him. This is why we call it a collateral murder. Um, unfortunately, Robert Sieber, who was uh, due to join us this evening, Edward Snowden's lawyer is unable to, to be with us this evening, but I'm delighted to introduce uh, Kristen Raffneson, who's the editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, and Deepa Driver, who has spearheaded the Free the Truth campaign, which has been uh, incredibly inspirational and has done so much to uh, bring to the attention of the general public uh, the uh, the plight of uh, Julian Assange. But let me start by first of all going to to Kristen and uh, and just ask uh, Kristen if you could just give us your thoughts uh, about two things really. One, what uh, happened in the uh, court hearing of well, Julian's show trial, if I can put it that way, uh, but also what, what was contained in the Iraq war logs uh, that uh, were published 10 years ago to, uh, tomorrow. Mm. Well, it's incredible. Uh, well, let me start to thank uh, thank you for having me on here. Uh, it's incredible to think back, and it's uh, that it's been ten years uh, since we uh, had these stressful days in in London preparing the release of of these uh, extremely important documents. Uh, Three hundred and ninety one thousand field reports from the U.S. military, basically outlining the entire uh, war in Iraq uh, in the words uh, of the U.S. military uh, from uh, January 2004 to December 2009. This was unprecedented. This was the largest uh, leak in military history and one of the largest leaks ever. Uh, and uh, it was of a tremendous importance. 
in it had a shocking effect uh, on everyone that uh, that uh, were diving into this material because what it uh, pertained was the uh, the brutal truth of the war written uh, by the in invading armies into Iraq and uh, therefore uh, they could not deny the uh, authenticity of it or the truth that it that was exposed there uh, there it's hard to sum up all the stories that were uh, mined in this material uh, but uh, if i mention a few uh, it was the uh, the number of um, uh, deaths uh, and the fact that uh, uh, more than 60, about 60, 65 percent of all the deaths that were registered were civilian deaths. Uh, and the fact that uh, that the U.S. military was actually keeping a record uh, on the, uh, the, the, uh, the deaths in Iraq, which they had uh, denied earlier and, and said of, on record that they were not uh, uh, counting bodies, they were lying. That was exposed, and what uh, what came out of this was uh, uh, more than fifteen thousand previously unreported civilian deaths. And uh, in this release, we were working with the organization Iraq Body Count, who could add uh, that to their sort of online uh, memorial of, uh, of those who uh, lost their lives in in, in uh, this period. I mean, if we're, we're talking about uh, uh, more than 30 civilian deaths every day during this period of this uh, horrible war. Uh, in total, there was a, a reported 110,000 deaths in that period, and uh, that was uh, uh, almost certainly uh, uh, way below the, the real numbers of uh, the casualties uh, in, in that period. Uh, there were other stories that uh, that sprang out there and uh, which uh, uh, caused outrage. It was the incidents, the, the single incidents, the, the, the hundreds or thousands of incidents that added up incidents such as uh, uh, murdering civilians who were driving towards checkpoints and were driving too fast to, to uh, uh, according to the 18, 19 year old soldier from the US who was manning the checkpoint uh, and opening fire, killing entire families. Uh, the soldiers who were singling, singling out ch children and, and shooting them on the street. Uh, we're talking about the uh, uh, all the evidence of, of the torture, the, the rape, the murders that uh, were recorded in these documents. And what was uh, ex extremely damaging to the US military and was the, uh, the fact that they were observing from a distance, uh, torturing, maiming and killing of detainees by the Iraqi government. But they were ordered specifically by an, an, uh, 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 the uh, the top uh, from by Pentagon not to intervene, but collect the evidence and write reports. Uh, they should not intervene. That is um, uh, uh, basically a, a war crime in itself. Um, this is uh, sort of uh, swept away the uh, the. Uh, the, the, the last sort of little inch of uh, an attempt to legitimize the uh, the uh, this uh, this invasion and this this horror uh, before 2010, I believe there was a, a an attempt by many to at least say, of course, we knew all about the lies that were used uh, to to justify the invasions at that point. But people were still saying and trying to justify the, uh, this by saying, well, we had to get rid of Saddam Hussein. He was torturing and killing his citizens. But what we got there out of these reports was the evidence that in uh, under the, uh, the shield of the US military and the invading forces and the occupying forces, uh, the, uh, the, the puppet government in Iraq was basically doing the same thing uh, without intervention, without any attempt to stop it and, and uh, by the, the US military and the British forces as well. Uh, it, there were so many stories and we were watching the collateral murder video, which I took uh, a, a rich part in, in uh, preparing. We released that on April 5th in 2010. And actually there is a, there is a, a report in the Iraq war logs uh, pertaining to that incident. It is less than half a page and it does not reflect the truth. It, uh, it, it, 
all the individuals uh, that I mentioned there uh, as killed are called enemy combatants. Uh, so that gives you the idea of how things were categorized by the US military. Uh, that is absolutely untrue, of course, as you can see in, in the video evidence. I'd like to mention one one other incident that was reported uh, uh, and uh, and uh, by the U.S. military, and it actually pertains to the same helicopter unit that we uh, uh, we saw in the collateral murder video uh, with the call signal Crazy Horse One Eight. Uh, that incident uh, uh, was about uh, two individuals who uh, who were uh, being chased on a vehicle by the uh, uh, the, the Apache helicopter and they shot up on the vehicle uh, immobilized it and two individuals uh, jumped out and uh, threw away their weapons and uh, signaled surrender to the Apache helicopter who was uh, 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 hovering over uh, According to the report, uh, the uh, the uh, the crew on the Apache helicopter called their base and asked uh, what to do in the situation because there were uh, no ground troops nearby. And uh, the reply came back: "We have to uh, let's pass this one on to the lawyers at headquarters." And after the lawyers had been consulted, consulted, the reply came back: "Well, according to our handbook, you cannot." Uh, surrender to an aircraft so shoot them so these are the horrific stories uh, that when you have seen the apache helicopter video the collateral murder video you can envision uh, the, the horrors and 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 the, the criminality of uh, of this uh, um, this this in, in its entirety uh, uh, we can maybe talk about the, 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 the trial later, but I want to mention as well that th this was uh, a shocking evidence about the war and which came relatively close uh, in time after the, the start of the war, after the invasion. Uh, and I think that never before have we got this sort of uh, in entirety, the evidence of what happened in the war in their own words, in the words of the US military. Uh, we, of course, were also breaking new ground in the, the, the way we were, were uh, handling the material. It was very, very responsibili uh, re responsibly handled. The, it was heavily redacted. We were actually criticized for over redacting the material, which uh, uh, is quite contrary to the, uh, uh, the claim that uh, Wikileaks was irresponsible and, and put people in harm's way by the publication, which is a, a hollow argument. We were working in the biggest uh, media alliance ever put together at that time, uh, working on a single project. It included not just the uh, the publications originally uh, that we had worked with previously this summer, the, the German magazine Der Spiegel, the New York Times and The Guardian. We also worked with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism to create content for uh, a documentary on Channel 4, uh, uh, television content for Al Jazeera, both Arabic and English. We worked with Swedish television, Italian newspaper, um, and uh, El Pais and Le Monde in France. So it was a, 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 a biggest media alliance put together and it, it actually created uh, the understanding that uh, this is the way to go forward. And this is now what everybody is trying to do in uh, uh, with the limited to, uh, resources that the, the, the mainstream media has uh, uh, today. Uh, just as, a, as an opening to sum up, I mean, uh, um, it uh, th it was basically the entire truth of the Iraq war that was exposed. Mm -hmm. And uh, no one has been able to try to spin that in, in any way. It's impossible. It, the, the truth is there. It is yeah. still there. Maybe we haven't come to in terms with uh, uh, how to deal with it in, in our democratic societies. We have to accept that this was done on our watch. And even though we can claim it was not in our name uh, personally, it was our leaders who took part in that and and uh, and to bear the responsibility. No one has been brought to uh, uh, justice for the obvious war crimes that uh, were exposed there. And I think we still have a way to go to come to terms with how we're going to justify 
uh, uh, all the, the, the these wrongdoings that happened on our watch, basically. But that yeah. will is for the future. But the evidence is there. It's online. It will not go away. And we have to go back to that later. Julian uh, is on record, isn't he, as saying that, uh, you know, uh, wars, uh, well, virtually all wars over the last 50 years, at least, have been started uh, based on lies. And uh, if wars mm -hmm. can be started through lies, then, you know, we can mm -hmm. we can start peace by mm -hmm. getting the truth out there. And uh, it, it's mm -hmm. so, you know, shocking and appalling, frankly, that a truth teller mm -hmm. like Julian is is mm -hmm. languishing now, uh, facing in, in Belmarsh prison, potentially facing up to 175 years jail term, uh, which obviously is life, of course in the most horrendous mm -hmm. circumstances in the US if they're successful in extraditing mm -hmm. him. And, you know, mm -hmm. Julian has performed an international public service because these sorts of appalling war crimes have now mm -hmm. been brought to the attention of the world. Uh, and this mm -hmm. is something, of course, that the, the US authorities, the British authorities, the military industrial complex are desperate to keep mm -hmm. secret. And, uh, you mm -hmm. know, given, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the, 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 the sort of repressive legislation that, uh, that this government is looking to uh, pursue now. Uh, you know, the, the, the crucial importance of uh, people like Julian uh, and the crucial importance of winning this case and preventing this extradition, I mean, you know, it couldn't be starker in my opinion. But uh, deeper, I mean, obviously you've been um, very involved in, in the campaign and uh, in the Free the Truth campaign and um, doing incredibly important work but it's been an uphill struggle, hasn't it, in terms of getting the mainstream media to actually, you know, give this the the attention that it deserves. I mean, this is probably the most significant uh, case since the Pentagon Papers were uh, maybe even more significant than the Pentagon Papers were were uh, published by Daniel Ellsberg. And of course, we know from what the authorities are saying in the United States that if uh, they're successful in extraditing. Julian, then he's not going to get a fair trial over there because they're saying that the, you know, the U.S. Constitution won't apply in the same way that it did to uh, to 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 Alfred. What's your uh, take on on where we are and uh, and the, you know, why the media have, have taken the stance that they have done in, in in failing to report on the Julian's pride and not just failing to report it, but actually misrepresenting and distorting the truth about Julian. Um. Can I start, Chris, by actually saying that I, I got involved with this relatively recently. Like many people, um, while I was aware of the courage and the excellent work that Julian and Kristen and Joseph and others have done at WikiLeaks, um, I had not realised that when Julian took in asylum in the embassy, uh, I hope you can still hear me, um, the conditions that Julian was under was so horrendous. And it was when Julian, as we got to know that Julian was being dragged out of the embassy, that I really started to pay attention very closely. And it came as a real shock to me to find out that for years while he was in the embassy, he had a terribly nasty tooth infection and a serious shoulder injury, in addition to a long-term chronic lung condition since 2012. And the British government had uh, not allowed him to have basic medical treatment. And given the way we treated war criminals like and um, dictators, like Pinochet, for example, mm -hmm. it, it was just appalling to see this. When he was dragged out of the embassy, I, was, I couldn't believe it had happened because despite being uh, from a former colony of Britain and recognising the horrors that colonialism brought to other parts of the world, I had quite seriously expected some element of the rule of law to be upheld in Britain and to find British politicians complicit in the way Ecuador's sovereignty was violated um, and how the Ecuadorians were pushed into or uh, bribed into doing what they did to Julian really um, bothered me. That's when I started to pay very serious attention. And when Julian was taken into Belmarsh, that really was the low, last straw for me. I began to um, get involved with the grassroots movement and also started to um, attend all the hearings, including the administrative hearings. And more recently, I've uh, been the legal observer for the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers, attending 
all the days of the trial um, at the Old Bailey. And what John Sloboda, who was one of the expert witnesses at the trials, he's the co-founder of Iraq Body Count, said was that the Iraq war logs were the single largest contribution to public knowledge about civilian casualties in Iraq. They revealed an estimated 15,000 previously unknown deaths. 10 years on, the Iraq war logs, he says, remain the only source of information regarding many thousands of violent civilian deaths in Iraq between 2004 and 2009. By making this information public, Manning and Assange were carrying out a duty on behalf of the victims and the public at large that the US government was failing to carry out. And this, um, you know, we talk about Black Lives Matter and we're in Black History Month right now. And it is, it is atrocious to see the way in which black lives all over the world are being destroyed by British and American war crimes. And until Julian and WikiLeaks allowed, um, I remember going to a session where Patrick Coburn was speaking, the, the journalist, and he was saying that those on the ground in Iraq, some of the experts like him knew this was going on, these crimes were going on, but they didn't have the proof. And why didn't they have the proof? And this comes back to your question as to what, why are the journalists so quiet? It's because the journalists were censoring or self-censoring the information that is made available to the public about the crimes that our governments commit in our name. And this is what we need to deal with. And it is in this regard that I think um, it is shameful to see the absolute absence of serious mainstream critical journalism in relation to Julian's case. Yes, there has been coverage of the case. And I've seen some excellent articles from say, John Bilger from Charles Glass, Fidel Narvaez wrote an excellent one, Marjorie Cohn wrote something. And these are some excellent articles that have come out. But if you, across those uh, four weeks of the trial, if you look at the kinds of um, people who were, what were we talking about on the BBC? They had a journalist in court every day, almost every day. Was any report of any meaning done? And this shows you how, how terribly skewed the court, court process was for even in terms of basic open justice. On the first day, 40 um, civil society organizations found out that they no longer had access to the court. Those of us who were members of the public who were queuing outside to get into the court, to the public gallery, there were two courts in operation, one with the trial, one which was an adjacent court. Both courts had 33 seats each in the public gallery, so 66 seats across the two public galleries. How many members of the public were allowed into court? Two. And uh, on parts of the day five, towards it's only at the end of week three that the, that the seats that were reserved for VIPs by the judge were even released to the public after complaints from civil society organizations that these people who were VIPs had not shown up in the first three weeks. I'm, I'm shocked and horrified at the journalists who were sitting in the, in the court, many of whom not just didn't report about the case. I saw one who came in and ate a sandwich and read a newspaper and went away. There were of course some good journalists and huge credit to them, both covering it online and covering it in the room. But there were others who were, who, who, who seriously do not seem to want to understand what is going on. I saw a comment from the BBC online from one of their journalists saying that uh, the reason they weren't covering it is because it was repetitive. Yes. yes. Rape, murder, torture, the potential to poison the defendant, spying on the defendant, the government's colluding on, on spying on a sovereign embassy on British soil and the British being complicit in that. The city of, uh, not the city of London, the um, the city, not what do you call it, the mayor of London's office approving the budget for the Metropolitan Police to spend tens of millions of pound, pounds surveilling yeah, both yes. uh, the public outside mm -hmm. and Julian. And this was allowed in the name of justice, supposedly. I mean, this is just horrendous. And this makes me ashamed to be, to to be, to think that I even thought there would be a semblance of justice. 
No, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, it's, it's shocking and shaming that, uh, you know, this is happening on British soil. I mean, Britain, you know, likes to sort of portray itself as the upholder of human rights and uh, the rule of law and uh, and uh, the scales of justice, as it were, and, and due process. And uh, it seems all of those are being trampled on. Uh, but as well as the, uh, the, the the absence of the um, uh, of the fourth estate, the, the, the mainstream media, the... Politicians haven't exactly covered themselves in glory either, have they, Deeper? I mean, uh, what sort of response have you had when you've sought uh, their support for your campaign, your Free the Truth campaign? Because it seems to me it's very rare that uh, any parliamentarian has raised this on the floor of the House. I find it hard to recall a single time uh, when it's happened. Uh, what has been your take on that? I mean, what, what responses have you received from, from parliamentarians when you've, when you've sought their support? Well, firstly, I'd like to thank those parliamentarians who actually did show support and people like um, and, and I know, you know, many people will will recognize that much of this was too little too late. And those of us on the left are particularly guilty of this because we haven't stood behind Junior in the way we should. And if you think of the left politicians who many of us look up to, it, it took a while for them to get on board and say something publicly, though they clearly understand how horrendous this case is. But we know of the the turmoil in British politics in the run up to the elections and the kinds of challenges they faced. Of course, those are no excuses. But I am proud to say that people like Richard Bergen, John McDonald, Diane Abbott, Jeremy Corbyn, um, more recently, Apsana Begum came to court. Um, yeah. I've seen Claudia Webb on one of the Don't Extradite Assange uh, campaign with, um, moderating a, an event. So people, I know you, Chris, were the first when you <laughs> tried to put in that early day motion. You've supported us right from the start. And in terms of true labor colors, that's where, from the working class movement, that's where the support came from. But I think the political discourse has been weak. And why has, I mean, how, we have to recognize that particularly, and, and all of my comments today, of course, are only in a personal capacity rather than on behalf of any organization. But we have to realize the serious worries we have. If Keir Starmer's CPS at, you know, at the time of um, um, the Swedish investigations, wrote to the Swedish authorities not to interview Julian in London, uh, said to them in explicit words, don't you dare get cold feet, and prevented justice from being served in the way in which um, they prolonged Julian's arbitrary detention. I mean, Julian, as a result of that detention, Julian has, I mean, we've, we've, this has been discussed in the media, so although I won't make comments about Julian's health, uh, in any detail because, you know, I'm saying this as an outsider and I feel bad to say it in front of people like Kristen who know Julian well. But, you know, he's he's suffering from osteoporosis. He cracked a rib when he tried to tie his shoelace. He's, um, he, when he was in the embassy, his maximum range that he could walk is about uh, 10 to 15, 10 meters or thereabouts within the embassy, I, I am told. He, his peripheral vision has been reduced because of the um, the the closed quarters that he's been in for years, his um, <laughs> his you know his his uh, psychological. They talk about you know his mental health condition. Well, if you stamp on somebody and kick them in the face, and mm. then you say they have a physical disability, that's exactly the same that what Britain, Ecuador, Sweden, Australia, and America have done to Julian. They have which is why, which I, feel so, the reason I feel so frustrated, um, uh, Deeper, at the, 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 the absence of, of uh, proper reportage from the, uh, the corporate media and indeed the, the lack of interest from parliamentarians. And, uh, you know, you mentioned some notable exceptions, but there are 650 MPs and uh, you named uh, less, than, uh, less than a dozen. And uh, that's, that's shame in my opinion, on the on the British uh, Parliament. It's shaming on our uh, representative uh, democracy. But if I could maybe return to you, uh, Kristen, because you mm. I believe, uh, were able to observe the trial from start to, to finish. And I wonder mm. when you uh, respond, if you could uh, perhaps give your thoughts as well about the, the media coverage, and particularly the Guardian and the Guardian, the mm. role in this, because many of us, you know, as it were, on the progressive left in this country, mm. always in the past looked to the Guardian as being the... Mm. 
champion of, of fearless progressive journalism. And yet not only have they distorted the truth about uh, Julian, um, they are central, are they not, to the uh, extradition proceedings that are being uh, taken against him. Uh, and I find it amazing, you know, for somebody, you know, brought up to believe that, you know, The Guardian was uh, a bastion of, of, of great journalism. But, but what, were you, what was your take on the, on the hearing itself, uh, Kristen, in terms of how it, how it was conducted? Well, first a note on the media. Uh, it, it was appalling how little was reported about the context, uh, content in the, in the, in the, during the hearing, which took a month, and, uh, and, uh, and especially the fact that uh, the BBC was there the entire time but didn't uh, report at all on it. Um, it. It is, of course, sh shocking because of the, uh, the implication for uh, journalists, especially in the UK and all around the world. Uh, it, it's, it's their job that is on the line. It's their interest to, to, uh, to monitor what's going on there. Uh, and uh, as much the UK journalists as journalists in other countries who are who who can, if the extradition goes ahead, uh, will never be uh, can securely uh, work on uh, uh, stories that uh, pertain to uh, national secure uh, to to uh, to US interest. If they uh, perceive that it is uh, against uh, their interest, they can pursue uh, individuals. Uh, uh, anywhere in the world that demand extradition and, and throw them in jail for decades or, or in, in, for life. Um, but uh, to, to be honest, uh, at least the, uh, the reporting on Julian and his plight war was uh, at least not negative, which we were seeing uh, only a year ago in the UK media. So there was a transformation from being negative to no reporting at all to, to uh, a, a, a little bit of interest. But it, it was shocking to uh, to how how obviously it was overlooked. Uh, just if 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 not only for the for, from the reflection of the the self interest of journalists and journalism in the UK. I mean, uh, for example, when when the judge Barrater uh, will will decide and, and and give her decision on on, Ju on January fourth, she will have to basically define. Uh, the official secrets acts because of the dual criminality elements uh, in, in the extradition process. And uh, if the understanding of, of, the, the, uh, of the American understanding will, 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 will prevail, that will mean what? It will be criminal for, uh, uh, for a UK journalist to uh, uh, receive and hold on to uh, classified material it will be a violation then, according to UK law, to of the official secrets act, just to receive it. It's 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 uh, incredible. Um, but in in overall, the the, the it, it was uh, quite a, a, a shocking experience. I, I I I did not have high hopes for the proceedings last month after we got a glimpse on uh, how things went in the first two weeks in February. But it was worse than I had anticipated. It was hurried through uh, through in in a in this very Im important trial uh, in, in in such a way that uh, that it it, it uh, um, diminished the witness statements, the important witness statements that were being presented there. Uh, they had to be. Uh, uh, re uh, read into in, in a summary into the court records, which is shocking. We're talking about uh, statements from uh, people like Noam Chomsky that were, were basically summarized uh, because there was no time left. And it, it was such an outrage that uh, the judge was demanding, uh, uh, the magistrate, uh, Vanessa Brecher, demanding a, a short version of a testimony from a, a torture victim, Al Masri. Who, who's, 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 of course, got justice on the base of, of WikiLeaks material. And uh, at that point in the, the hearing, basically, Julian couldn't stand anymore and said, I, I will shout it out from the glass cage. I will not have a tortured victim censored in this court. I mean, it, 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 it was just surreal to be a witness to this. Uh, and uh, in the end, uh, all this was hurried through because the uh, the magistrate had decided it would end on 
this day, even though we had lost days and days because of COVID uh, uh, scare that had to be postponed, the hearings, etc. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I have to say, you know, I've, I've, uh, I had before all this experience uh, a belief in in the UK justice system that there was uh, an ability there to deliver justice. Uh, but after this experience, I, I, uh, I'm not sure anymore. Mm. This case is is so blatantly a political. Uh, in, in nature, that it should have never reached this stage, mm. and it's incredible to witness the uh, the sort of positive demeanor that uh, the the magistrate had towards the prosecution, the uh, the lawyers working on on behalf of the United States when they were presenting their uh, uh, you know outrageous twist in, in the laws. I'll give you one example. I mean, the, the extradition laws, uh, extradition treaty. Uh, which is uh, not that old, I mean, it was, it's from this century, outlines and states specifically that you cannot be extradited on a, on a basis of a, a, a political um, uh, act. And, and now you have the defendant, Julian Assange, being indicted for uh, on the basis of the Espionage Act. It is it as political as it can get. And this was actually put into the treaty on the demand of the United States. But when this is pointed out, it is not really denied, but uh, but they say, well, uh, the extradition treaty has not, this clause in the treaty has not been incorporated into the extradition act in the law in the UK, thereby it's just a treaty. It, it doesn't matter in that respect. But on the other hand, we want him extradited on the basis of that treaty, but we, yeah. we will cherry pick and choose. It's outrageous. How, how can you present such an argument in a in a in a society that uh, uh, is ruled by law, um, and, and and the political nature of the entire process, the fact that uh, the fact that you have uh, 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 leaders of a country basically uh, uh, calling uh, uh, in such a biased manner and prejudge him like Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, yeah. uh, uh, both now and in his previous role as as the head of the CIA, Jeff Session the the attorney general, uh, and uh, it is it, totally impossible to get a fair trial there. And I mean, the evidence presented in the the courtroom uh, uh, in the timeline that shows that after after um, uh, Trump took power and after he had actually sent an emissary uh, in in the in, in the congressman uh, Dana Robacher to the embassy in in, uh, in in Knightsbridge to to offer. Uh, in a mafia-like deal to Julian, you know, you give us your source for the DNC leak, and, and I'll secure uh, a pardon from Trump. And and he said that he was basically on with the approval and the knowledge of Donald Trump. Uh, and I, when when Julian says, of course, I will never expose a source. A journalist doesn't do that. That's when we saw. The, the machine starting to roll and and the and the uh, Trump administration reversing what we now know was the decision under under Barack Obama uh, to uh, not to go ahead with uh, the uh, uh, indictment against Julian because of what they called the New York Times problem because they couldn't distinguish between what uh, WikiLeaks did and Julian and the New York Times nor the Guardian nor other and and if you needed any proof about the political atmosphere in the courtroom was towards the end when uh, when the uh, uh, at Fitzgerald the barrister for Julian was saying well um, uh, they were talking about timetable and 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 Fitzgerald was saying well uh, uh, unless something major happens I think we could finish this by this date and uh, uh, and uh, Judge Baratzer basically asks him bluntly when you talk about something major things. Uh, would that include the outcome of the U.S. election? And we were all shocked. I mean, she was basically admitting the political yeah. nature of what's going on in the courtroom. If it matters at all, the outcome of the election in the United States and the third of next month, it, it is basically underlining the fact that this is a political persecution. 
Yes. This is it, it. So it, it it was shocking on so many levels. I could go on and on about the 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 the, the constant shocks in the that courtroom in the old Absolutely. Daily. I mean, and and it's interesting, uh, uh, Kristen. I mean, you, you know, you've just revealed there uh, uh, so much more than anything we've heard in our corporate media in this in this country. And uh, you know, and it's even mm. about the uh, you know the BBC correspondent saying, uh, oh well, it was uh, it was repetitive, implying implying it was kind of boring. You know, I mean, it's it's just yeah. astonishing. I mean, truly astonishing. And as far as Donald Trump is concerned, of course, there's plenty of clips. I think was it in the mm. uh, in the in the 2016 election where he was uh, very very complimentary about WikiLeaks and. Mm. Uh, Obviously, seems to have, uh, have changed the attack uh, subsequently. Mm. But, um, but Deepa, you were outside, weren't you, uh, for, for uh, a large uh, part of the? Because, uh, uh, as you mentioned, unable to get in, and uh, I know there's been some complaints about the way in which the the, the police actually, you know, as it were, controlled the the, the crowds that were outside. I mean, what, what was your experience of the policing of the um, of, of the crowd who had gathered outside the court? Um. Firstly, I, I, my time outside the court just reaffirmed my in to the very negative aspects of the court, but also the very positive aspects of solidarity. It was amazing to see so many grassroots activists there helping to get, um, you know, helping us by, by, you know, holding our space if we wanted to go to the loo while we were standing in the queue because, you know, you only have two seats and if you miss your space, you can't get in. It, it was, um, so I'd like to firstly thank them and acknowledge what they did. Um, I know Rebecca Vincent at Reporters Without Borders who was, um, who she and I attended almost all the days between us and um, she also had, had this sense of gratitude towards them um, in allowing her to to understand what was going on. But um, it was also very depressing to see the way in which we were treated. Um, I mentioned earlier that I was a legal observer of the Holiday Inn Society and I asked if I could go in. I was told, um, no, you know, <laughs> that won't be taken into account. I wasn't even allowed to hand in the paperwork. I had, I emailed it in, but I didn't hear back for a while and it was all very complicated. Um, you will be I mean, to go into this additional court where all we could see was a, cam a a screen which was about 30 feet away, like a home television screen. We queued from about six in the morning to get in at about 10 o'clock. Um, when you got into the court, you weren't allowed to take water or even, you know, uh, uh, forget about other things, even if you could chewing them inside. So for the whole of the day, you en ended up basically, um, or at least, half of the day at each in each half you ended up without even a, a glass of water to drink i'm a disabled um i have a disability and i was told i asked if i could use the disabled lift and i was told that i would lose my place in the queue because the disabled lift was at the other entrance and if i didn't climb the six floors of stairs to the top i wouldn't be um let in so my disability relates to pain so i kind of <laughs> dealt with it and went up but this is the kind of access supposedly in a system which is where the, the Equality Act applies. I think the other thing as a, as a disabled person, I also felt very sorry for Julian because here is a man who is sitting in court yeah. in his own trial, being served the information that he needs to prepare for this trial at a time when he's under huge psychological duress on the first day of the trial. So he's not able to meet with the lawyers properly before because he's been locked down and his lawyers have not been able to communicate with him. They're having to post things in which then don't reach him. He then, in the court, he is this clever, intelligent, hugely capable man, is reduced to being sit sitting down at the back of the court, in the dock, far away from his lawyers who are at the front of the court, and he has to talk over the US uh, uh, people who are in the back rows in order to communicate with his lawyers he has to get on his knees and speak through a small you know hole in the glass to tell somebody oh i need to talk to my lawyers and this is the kind of adjustment they do for somebody who has who it is it is clear from the evidence as well you know which even the us admit he is suffering from depression he is having suicidal thoughts hundreds of times a day he is um in in a lot of pain i mean this it, it is just a travesty to watch this. And I, I felt in some ways 
you know, some amount of catharsis to participate in that pain because I felt what I was doing was, you know, the, he's suffering solitarily in Belmarsh 23 out of 24 hours a day, locked mm -hmm. in. And what yeah. he what he can expect in the U.S. and sorry, Chris, to go on about this, but people need to know what he can expect in the U.S. pre-trial is to be in under something called special administrative measures. If you've never heard of this, these are conditions where the defendant and his lawyers are under serious restrictions, so they cannot communicate to the press. This is pre-trial, so this is somebody who's on remand. Yeah, when he is in that jail they say he will be in his cell 22 hours a day he will be allowed out of his cell for individual recreation and this individual recreation euphemism is that he's moved to another cell just like his which is again empty where he will be allowed to pace around he will his only contact will be through a, a metal slot in the door through which his his meal will be passed and mm -hmm. this is what Britain wants to condemn a journalist and a publisher to. This is horrendous. And we That's should all be protesting. Neil, Neil as well, the, uh, the UN um, rapporteur on torture has, has essentially accused Britain of, of actually torturing Julian Assange. I mean, this is just truly shocking that, that Britain is responsible for this. I mean, I, it's funny, almost unbelievable, frankly, but uh, this is, there it is, it's happening. But um, in the last 15 minutes or so, before I go to uh, to Sean to get any um, reaction from our uh, viewers, uh, if I could go back to to you, Kristen, and give us your thoughts on what do you think the future is for the kind of fearless investigative journalism that Julian Assange and WikiLeaks represents if they are successful in extraditing and sentencing him? I would say that this this is such a serious uh, precedent that will be set here that it will it will kill off uh, all serious investigative journalism efforts, uh, especially when it comes to uh, uh, matters of uh, that pertains to national security. It will basically silence everybody. No one will dare to to uh, have a critical. Uh, dissection of uh, of the uh, uh, the United States foreign policies, their wars, and their uh, 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 actions uh, overseas, and that is that is uh, the aim. Let's let's. You said at the opening, Chris, that uh, and you cited Julian. Julian said, "Well, uh, we, if we can exp expose wars uh, and, and the truth about wars uh, uh, in the way we were doing with the Iraq warlocks." Uh, we should be able to get to the point to actually, and, and we should strive for stopping war happening uh, uh, by exposing the truth about wars. And, and we, we can get there. And I think that's the realization that is uh, uh, lies at the, the foundation of the, the persecution of Julian. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, they the, the forces that we are dealing with realize, and uh, especially with the... the uh, revelations like in the Iraq war logs, that the possibility is there to actually stop wars. And, and of course, that is the vested interest that they, are, they have in, in, in trying to strike off. And so they, 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 were, they have decided to use any measures uh, uh, possible to basically silence Julian Assange and more than that, basically kill him. And I have to have a word about the, the prison conditions. Deepa is right. I mean, the prison conditions in Belmars are, are horrible. And yeah. we heard the, the, the evidence of that in the, the courtroom. And, uh, and uh, the most cynical part of it, that the worst treatment was in the, the, the period when they, they, uh, they put Julian in the health ward. That meant basically uh, a, a total isolation in Belmars. It was used as a punishment. They emptied the corridor when he went to, from uh, from his cell to uh, to any other point to, to make sure he wouldn't uh, meet anybody and couldn't have any communication. That's where he, when his his mental health deteriorated in the weeks in the health ward. ward. Uh, but bear in mind that even though Belmars is 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 horrible and the treatment there is horrible, what awaits him? And it's not even contested the description of it of the yeah. prosecution in the courtroom. The, the so-called special administrative measures, the SAMs, which always remind me of other sort of niceties in words like collateral damage or enhanced interrogation techniques. Mm. SAMs basically means uh, isolation. It means torture. 
it is a torture to put somebody in a cell which is uh, uh, 15 square feet. It's, uh, it's the size of a, a parking lot and keep the person there without a contact with other human beings for years. That's pre-trial. And, 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 and pre-trial in the US in this case could mean two to three years. So uh, let's it, remember, it, it is basically death. And let's remember as well, Kristen, that I mean, Julian shouldn't even be incarcerated at the moment. I mean, he was he was put in prison, wasn't he, for a, for I mean, the offence of skipping bail when he sought asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy for understandable reasons. That was bad enough, in my opinion, that he received a jail term for that. But that jail term has now elapsed, and yet he's been detained in 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 this high security prison in, in the most inhumane conditions. On the grounds, as I understand, the judge said that he poses a flight risk. He's, he's, been, he's been on. He's, he's been on. He has been on remand. He has been on remand now uh, for more than uh, a year. Yeah. Uh, and it it breaks all guidelines. The guideline yeah. is you should not keep anybody on remand for more than 180 days. That's maximum. He's been there for 370 days. Re re rewriting the rules or simply ignoring the rules. I mean, this is, you know, it's a complete breach of the rule of, of law, of due process. And, uh, you know, we, we should all be up in arms about this because, uh, you know, this is the thin end of the wedge. If they get away with this, then, as you say, Kristen, you know, we are, uh, it's a very dark road that lies ahead, in my opinion, for, for all of us. And uh, that's why it's so important that we, that we build a, and continue to build. And there is a lot of support there, but we need to continue to build that support for Julian. And on that point, I mean, perhaps just in conclusion, before I bring Sean, Sean back in, if we could maybe go to you, uh, Deepa, firstly, and then get a comment from you, uh, uh, Kristen, as well, is what would your advice be to people watching this program this evening? What can they do? What more can they do to support Julian to try and help your campaigns to go, ensure that justice prevails and, and that we secure Julian's release? What would you say, uh, Deepa? What would you advise people to do? this evening watching. Thanks, Chris. And I, um, I I just want to, if I may, with your permission, just add to one thing that we were talking about earlier to say that there is currently a court case going on in Spain where evidence has emerged of the way in which the United States government has spied on Julian Assange and his lawyers. So breaching all legal privilege and breaching medical confidentiality. They've also put stickers on the windows of the Ecuadorian embassy in order to be able to spy on them from the building opposite. So hearing conversations in a sovereign embassy on British soil. And this, these are things that we, we really need to be concerned about. And I would urge people to follow the trial. And I know Sean very kindly has posted some links um, that, that are useful in relation to the trial. I'd urge people to follow Craig Murray, who has done an absolutely sterling job reporting from the court every day. I know Craig um, writes some very interesting and detailed pieces with a lot of knowledge from his own experience as a whistleblower. I think people have to firstly recognize that this case is about the criminalization of whistleblowing and the criminalization of journalism and everything else beyond that is a distraction. Yes, yeah. it is a horrendous, horrendous, uh, torture of an individual and I feel for Stella and her children and Julian's parents for the kind of hardship they are facing. But this trial, as much as it is about Julian Assange, it is also about the crimes that our governments commit in our name, the use of classification to hide crimes, to, to prevent embarrassment, and then the use of the law to in the case of Julian, and this was revealed through the Stratfor leaks, they want to move him from country to country, you know, leave him in prison, treat him like a, um, be a prison bride and to eat cat food. And this is yeah. what they say in writing. And this, if Julian, what he revealed and Chelsea, what, they reve what she revealed, despite the torture that she faced later, were things that provided us with information. And we talked at the start of this about, you know, peace can be achieved by revealing the truth. But we ha we are now at 10 years after the Iraq war logs. And much as it pains me to say so, the, the transparency has achieved a huge transformation in some ways in terms of our understanding of war, but very little transformation in terms of the way in which we are funding wars in Yemen, in other parts of the world. 
And well, that, that, they, and they, they, these are political yeah. questions, aren't they, uh, Deeper? And this is where, you know, we need our political class to step up exactly. or replace them. But we also need ordinary people to educate themselves and to organise. Sorry to speak over you, Chris, beg your pardon. That's okay, no, no, fine. No, I'm just saying, you know, our parliamentary, our political class are not fit for purpose. And, uh, and that, you know, the point you're making about, you know, the lack of change that the uh, publication of the war logs is, 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 you know, is brought about, I mean, is, is because of the failing of, of our political class. And, and this is why, I mean, we are supposed to live in a democracy where it's in our hands to, to, to change that. And if our parliamentarians aren't stepping up to the plate, we need to replace them with people that will do that. And because this isn't just about one man, important though that is, as I've already said, this is about all of us. This is about all of our people. But I mean, um, uh, just before I bring, I keep saying I'm going to bring Sean in in a moment, but I just wanted to get a thought from you, if I can, uh, Kristen, just in terms of whether you've got any 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 comments about what people can do to help you and, and, and WikiLeaks and, and to support Julian, over and above what uh, what, uh, what Deepa just mentioned in terms of, you know, following uh, the various links that, she, that she's put on or had put on the screen. Yeah, Deepa is right. I mean, it it it. it uh, I encourage people to go because they cannot trust the mainstream media in reporting on what's uh, what's going on there. To uh, all the, the the venues that are reporting on uh, on the, the facts of the case, and uh, uh, but they can also put pressure on the mainstream media, or the, the the corporate media. They can put pressure on on, and I've I've seen that in in, in comment sections and. Uh, it is a possibility to put a uh, pressure on them and, and shame them into actually into action, and it it sometimes works. and uh, And I, I, I urge people to do that. And of course, they should should pressure their politicians, their local MP, into take action and uh, and make it known that it has a political cost to ignore this case. And and you know, if politicians have 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 uh, have, have some sense, they should start to take the polls. I, I have taken the polls in the country in the UK, and so have my my, my colleagues, and we know that this is uh, uh, there is there is there is a lot of support for for Julian in the United Kingdom. I, I'm very thankful for that, and uh, and if politicians would, would dare to ignore this case and and uh, and to pretend it, it doesn't affect them, they are very very wrong because people and the voters. They do care, yeah. uh, and they have to make it known in any way possible that it will have a political cost if you ignore this. Mm, no, no. Well, thanks very much indeed, uh, Kristen and, and, and Deepa. Um, I wonder if I can uh, bring in um, Sean now to uh, get any uh, reaction from our viewers this evening. Any any comments from our viewers this evening, uh, Sean, that um, Deepa and, uh, and Kristen might have uh, a response to in the last couple of three minutes? Um, yeah, we've had lots of comments tonight. Um, people have been fascinated by this incredible story um, and um, they feel really educated this evening. A lot of the comments coming through, uh, people are listening with complete fascination um, about what's been going on with Julian, um, with the trial, his condition in uh, Belmarsh Prison and also um, with the refreshing them with the memory of the Iraq war logs which was so very very important um i just want to give a quick shout out to some of our regulars on um youtube we 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 get a lot of people um tuning in every week we've got kevin mark uh jack t um mm -hmm. john h uh Samsha, um nj uh, Amo, um, and, and others. If I've missed you out, uh, I'm very sorry. We've got Faraz and uh, Leslie and Lizzie all over on uh, Facebook. So I want to thank them all for tuning in this evening. If you've just joined us for the first time tonight, please subscribe and um, you'll be able to get notifications for when we go live each Wednesday. No, so going back to the... Sorry, no, Chris. No, 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 no. OK, so going back to a couple of questions, I think you you asked one of them. People are asking what what they can do. Uh, someone has asked, um, can the unions create a, a strike or non-cooperation movement to harass persecutors, uh, persecutors of Assange? Um, John Aitcher um, asks, as this veil falls and reveals the extent of the complicity, how can we hope to hold to account this utter mass of the involved, i.e. the forces, governments, journalists, mainstream media, um, security forces? Perhaps you could try and answer that one. So the question was, how can we hope to hold to account the utter, this utter mass of all the involved? 
yeah, I mean, and I mean, <laughs> obviously, as a trade unionist, we might have uh, have a comment to make on that. We, we we are sort of out of time, but let's just sort of uh, give you an opportunity to say a few words and and, uh, and Kristen, and then we'll close. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to say in terms of organising. I think, firstly, pe- once people are educated, they will be able to engage with things like doing misfeasance and misfeasance in public office complaints, ensuring that our institutional arrangements are fit for purpose. Also, of course, campaigning with MP, supporting the Don't Extradite Assange campaign, supporting Stella Morris in terms of her fundraising for paying for the... the the support that Julian needs and the Stella family. being Julian's partner, deeper. Julian's partner, indeed, mm. indeed, who has very young children, and um, you know, uh, as to to raise two young children at a time when your partner is suffering in this way is just horrendous. So my heart goes out to her. I'd also like to um, say that people have to the trade unions, and I'm a trade unionist myself, and I say that the trade unionists have failed to recognise. Um, some of the trade unions have come forward, for example, I think the NUJ motion that was passed is a good one. We've had good motions across branches in Unison and Unite. Um, but the trade unions have to recognise that what will ha- what happens to Julian also affects whistleblowing, not just in relation to war crimes, but in relation to all kinds of crimes that American corporations commit and the reach of the American state across the rest of the world. And they also have to think about how the British state is dealing with whistleblowers and people who enable whistleblowers and how that criminalization will affect workers. And this, this, the trade union movement needs to be stronger on this. Uh, absolutely. And, and and I think it's also important, deeper, just to add to that, that um, the government, as I mentioned in, in my remarks, are bringing in legislation which could have a profound effect on trade union activities. The one legislation which, which provides for, and it says it explicitly in the bill, it, there's a clause in the bill which provides for the security services and the police to engage in criminal conduct. This is a kind of, unpre- I mean, yeah, we know they've kind of been doing that, but now they're kind of explicit about it. And the sorts of things that will be permissible to commit criminal conduct, if it's deemed to be on the grounds of national security or preventing and detecting crime or preventing disorder. So that has an issue, that has an implication in terms of, of demonstrations and our right of, to freedom of speech in that sense. But that's more... More, more, even more sinister than that is the reference to where it's deemed in the interests of the economic well-being of the United Kingdom. If it's deemed in the interests of the economic well-being of the United Kingdom, well, who's going to make that judgment? I mean, what we're saying is, you know, anti-capitalist campaigners. You know, this is really, it seems to me, you know, giving carte blanche to uh, the the uh, the deep state to to to. You know, commit criminal conduct against people who are taking action against corporate capitalism, which has had such a profoundly damaging effect on millions of people in this country. And at the same time, taking the kind of action that they're doing to 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 close down uh, free speech, to close down uh, a free press uh, and with the interaction that we're taking against uh, Julian Assange. So this is absolutely, it seems to me, in the interests of trade unions to be uh, very much... At the uh, in the vanguard, in, indeed, they should be in actually speaking out uh, for Julian. Uh, as I've already said, not just because it's you know the terrible treatment of one man, but because of the wider implications of it all. But uh, Chris, I'm going to go to you for the for the last word yeah. because we're about three minutes over time now. But any final closing uh, remarks, uh, and then we'll close. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we are grateful for the, the the support we've had from from trade unions, but of course we would uh, would like to get more uh, and uh, and to get people to join forces, the uh, the the organisations in our society to uh, who have uh, taken an interest there. Uh, we have you know journalistic organis- uh, organisation of journalists, Reporters Without Borders, Amnesty International, etc. They should all and pen. Uh, they should all uh, join forces basically to put a pressure on on uh, in this case and and just to remember this is not over it's not going to be over on on june uh, sorry january 4th uh, where uh, it is very likely that uh, the the magistrate uh, will decide uh, in the favor of the united states it will be appealed and uh, and so this will go on this fight and uh, hopefully 
beyond uh, the restraints of, of COVID. Uh, so there will be opportunity uh, for us to actually meet on the uh, in mass, which always works best uh, uh, post COVID. I hope that's going to happen. Just on a a, a note, uh, because we, we we started out talking about the Iraq warlocks and the material from Iraq. Uh, and and uh, just remember that the the uh, the revelations about the the the, the horrors uh, committed by the troops in the country when it what were exposed it caused such an outrage in the country that when obama was actually seeking an extension of the amnesty for the us troops in the country uh, the government in Iraq was forced to basically say, no, we cannot. And that led to the removal of, of the remaining troops in Iraq. So it, it, it in, in an essence, ended the war. Uh, so that, that, that was a, a, a positive contribution to the, uh, the uh, to, of, of that revelation. But the fight will continue and we mo need more than ever in a, in a society now that is basically on a, on a slippery slope down to a very sort of dark place. We see international agreements being uh, ignored uh, uh, or uh, international organizations being uh, ignored as well. Even the United Nations uh, in the UK are, are do, do not have any bearings in the courtroom. And I'm quoting basically Director T1 Judson in, 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 in their son's case, etc. cetera. So, uh, we do join forces if we want to change the tide. And uh, I got the, it, it dawned on me uh, towards the end of the hearing in, in Old Bailey last month. Uh, but the, uh, the fact of the matter is that this is not Julian Assange on trial. This is our society that is on trial. Yeah. It's our civilization. Are we going to stand by and just have people being tortured, uh, war crimes being committed? Uh, and uh, justice being ignored, like in the Assange case, that's not going to reflect well on history. And uh, we're going to end up in a very bad place if we don't yeah. resist and take action. Well, listen, thank you very much indeed to our speakers, uh, Kristen Harafnison and uh, Deepa Driver. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for watching. We've had a truly international audience today. Thank you to Consortium News, who've uh, live-streamed the, the broadcast this evening as well. I understand thousands of people have been watching it on, on that platform this evening. I hope you found the discussion uh, interesting. Um, in my opinion, we are in very dangerous times. Uh, if we're not careful, we are entering a, a, a truly dystopian world, and it, it's therefore so important for all of us that we stand together in solidarity, that we that we support the campaign, that we get behind uh, Kristen and WikiLeaks, that we support uh, the work that Deeper Driver is doing and others to ensure that justice prevails. Uh, and that um, in many ways, you know, the reputation of Great Britain is on the line as well. And, uh, you know, we are all British uh, citizens or many of us are British citizens uh, watching this evening. And, uh, you know, this is being done in our name and it's simply not good enough. So, We've gone nearly 10 minutes over, so apologies for that, but I think it was a very fascinating and, uh, and worthwhile discussion this evening. So apologies for going over uh, slightly over the, uh, the allotted one hour, but I hope you found it useful and interesting. And, and please take up the advice that Deepa and Kristen uh, suggested in terms of uh, getting involved and, and supporting the campaign. Thank you for watching this evening. Tune in next week at 7 p.m. and good night. Thank you.